Dun, dun, dun. We're back, and this is episode seven. We're here to um, what's what's the proper terminology for what we're about to do here? So these are questions that were posted on Piano Piano Street um, Reddit uh, to piano forums asking questions. I think I should start with an apology. Whatever I say here is just presented as my own opinion, and please take it with a grain of salt. And I, I apologize in advance for hurting anybody's feelings. That's not the intent, but if it happens, I'll have to say more Hail Marys. Um, yeah, we ready? Yeah, let's do it. Oh god. Using the thumb on the black keys allowed. What? Using the thumb on a black key? Because if you're playing an F sharp major arpeggio, you're going to use your nose? Like, wh where did that come from? Number one, um, ladies and gentlemen, please know that there there is no piano police that will come and give you a ticket if you put your thumb on a black key. That's number one. Number two, in some cases it's appropriate, in some cases maybe not so appropriate or not so comfortable. If it's comfortable, great. If it's not comfortable, thumb down. Next. Is finger strength a myth? Ooh. Mm. Is finger strength a myth? Is it a myth? It's not a myth, it's a thing. It's a real thing. Like, yeah, you have a finger and does it have strength or not? It's The finger is real, strength is real, there's no myth. But for this instrument, gravity is your best friend. Ooh, that's one for you. How often do you guys utilize mental play and how much does it help you? Mm. Tremendously. <laughs> Without doing any kind of mental practice, every time I went on stage, I would flip the f out. I would think, I would literally think like, oh my god, what's the first note? If I had done that the day before, or like 10 minutes before, I wouldn't have freaked out as much. So a lot. So why is it so difficult, do you think? It's such a daunting task to think about, like, oh my god, I have to think about what my fingers look like on the keys. The other part of it is... <laughs> This is just probably just like a personal issue, but like I'll close my eyes to like visualize. And then I fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> Can someone explain the mechanics of coming <laughs> off the seat? What? What? Please try to ignore the... What? Do you know what they mean though? No. Like when there's such a big chord that you like literally jump. You see people do that? It reminds me that my friend, when he was playing the Rahmanov Paganini variation, was like, tam, pa -ta -ta -tam, and then closed the lid. <laughs> that was very theatrical. <laughs> Look, you want to be theatrical? Be theatrical. Some yeah. people would love it. I'm, I'm not a fan, but Ezra, you're a fan? Um, I personally wouldn't do it, but I like, like I said in the other video, like I really like choreography, so if it works for you, then... Right? <laughs> Uh, what do you think is the point of being a concert pianist? I, seriously, if you are asking the question... Yeah. Really, I don't understand the attitude of you people. Next. When we hear great pianists perform, commonly used word for description is color, spelled the British way. Uh, when someone's outstanding in the control of the piano, you can hear the different colors, even in the phrase and passages that have the same volume and character. For example, okay, what is this? What's the, what's the question? How do you produce these colors? How long do you have? Can you reread it in a British accent now? No, I was told to never ever repeat anything in a British accent ever again. Color. Um, yeah, how do you produce colors on the piano? Uh, I think a lot of it is technique. But specifically? Or, um, well, just like listening to the sound. Like, if you take a certain chord in your, in your piece or whatever, and you just, like, play it until you like the sound of it. But what are you adjusting as you're, you're changing the color? What specifically gets changed? Uh, well, your speed of attack is... I've taught him well. So that's in it. one sentence. Colors in the piano are a total result of the speed of attack. You go quickly through the key, it's going to be loud, you're going softly, you go slowly, it's going to be soft. That's the beginning and end of it. Mm. Slide is going to give you rounder sound. Using more flesh is going to give you a rounder sound. Tippy toes is going to give you more pronounced, more articulated sound. It's all in the speed of attack and how your fingers are going through the keys. Watch the video. Anybody else play horribly in front of the piano teachers? Ooh, ooh, please. Ezra? Only. 
only. We have that on video, right? No, we don't. What is it about piano teachers that make us play so badly in the lesson? Discuss. When you hold your uh, instructor to such an ideal, like, I think you get into this mental state where you're like, well, I have to be perfect in front of my yeah. professor. So you're like, you're, if you're constantly thinking about that, that's all you're going to think about. All of us who have played for teachers and have heard students play for us, we know the one sentence you should never use in a piano lesson is, it was much better at home. Don't ever, ever say that. Yeah. Um, no, that's such a cop out. I mean, right. she'd go on stage in front of the artist and go, ladies and gentlemen, it was <laughs> much better in the practice room. Seriously? That said, I would play so badly in my lessons for Beta. It was, it was just like excruciating. You think you can hear them thinking, you're like, well, that was bad. Like, wow, he's still playing loud as ever. <laughs> like, where's the new one? Pedal, hello, pedal. Like, yeah. rushing, rushing, rushing. Like, you can actually have the whole script of what goes through their head going as you're playing the piece, right? Yeah. yeah. Ezra, is technique really necessary or should you just focus on the music? Yeah, man, I think you should just, just the music. Have you ever tried cooking without cutting the vegetables? I don't know. Have you ever tried driving without learning what it is? <laughs> I don't even know where to start with this question. I mean, technique really necessary. Anything that is complex and exciting and interesting is going to involve some level of technique. The, the idea that you could just avoid addressing that issue altogether is ridiculous. Now, if you're asking me, do I have to practice technique and the scales and the exercises until I'm, you know, old and decrepit? And the answer is absolutely not. You just need to understand how the mechanics of the hands work and, you know, how to solve difficult passages by fingering and hand motions, all that stuff. And that's actually exciting. It's interesting, right? That's right. It's interesting. Yeah. He's lying. But yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> And if you get on board of that, oh, it's actually interesting, then it doesn't become just like, oh, I have to practice my hand and for five hours a day to get warmed up. Well, you know, some people say that if you just listen hard enough, you'll get the right technique. Oh my God. Say that again? If you listen hard enough? Yeah, you'll get the right technique. What the hell does that mean? Like, I'm listening. I've listened to our Martha Argerich so hard, I still can't play like her. What do you do about additions? Hmm. Start learning from the Urtex so you don't get confused by what is truth and what is not. Then, after you feel you have a strong um, understanding of what the text actually is, you can start seeing what other editors wrote in. Now, why is that helpful? Sometimes an editor will have a brilliant fingering. Happened to me. I found a really wonderful fingering that never occurred to me. Uh, to if the editor is somehow related to the composer, there's probably validity. Like, for example, Clara Schumann editing Robert Schumann's work, there is something there. Now, yeah. I don't always agree with what I see there. And you compare the, the Ur text with what she did and go like, I don't know, but it's interesting. And the most brilliant thing is that now some of the pieces actually have the autograph or facsimile of the, the early editions, and you can actually see something in the progression of that it's, it's, I, I think it's beautiful to see the composer's handwriting. I think that's always very moving. Oh, that's what it actually looked like. Yeah. Right? If you see a lot of stuff scribbled uh, on the score, it means that it's been heavily edited. Throw those to the fire. I got ahead of myself, but can someone please tell me what am I supposed to be doing with my left hand? Go get help. Reminds me of this story that um, I think it was Carl Schachter in one of his classes said that they were listening. Somebody came in to play the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven, and he started playing, and he's, he's playing C major, and and they all sort of stopped there and was like, "Wait, what? What's going on?" And they're like, "Oh, I thought I would add the sharps later." <laughs> you're lying. No. <laughs> so, when you're learning the piece. Don't learn it without the sharps and flats. And with that, we're going to uh, say goodbye. Thank you for joining us. This was entertaining, I think. Yeah. I think. Hopefully we didn't hurt anybody's feelings. Yeah. Um, but yeah, see you next time. Bye.